Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Genome Informatics Pack Bio Workshop. I am one of your speakers and also the moderator, Liz. Um, we have a very packed agenda, so I will get right started. If you have questions at any time, please please use um, they can use, Helena. They can use the Q and A. Yes, correct. Okay, yeah. Please use the Q and A at any time to um, ask questions, and I will probably try to reserve one or two minutes at the end of each talk for people to um, answer questions. And also, we will st also be on Slack. You can definitely use Slack um, to ask us questions. I know this is not a session, but you can probably find me, Elizabeth Singh, on the Slack uh, CSHL Slack channel. Okay, so here's my talk. I decided that given this is a pack file workshop, instead of uh, giving a very specific talk, I want to basically create a mini docu series that uh, talks about the pack file tools that people have developed over the years for genome assembly and transcriptome. There's no better way to start a talk than with this tweet by Hen Lee. Also, this tweet will have some references to comic books and sci fi shows. It's 5 30. So let's start with a brief history of the long read assembly verse. And in case you're wondering why is your favorite assembler or the assembler you wrote is not included in this and wondering if you've gone into one of the branching timelines, rest assured there's still only a single universe. The hope is to highlight some of the assemblers here to show the, the trends rather than the complete history over time. So let's go back 23 years before the quality first credo of the Human Genome Project. What were the demands back then? It was 100 kV of contiguity with a minimum of QV40. That just tells you how long we've come. But even before the first pack biol complete bacterial genome was assembled, theory had already been developed to look at the length requirements to achieve a complete assembly. Note that this theory was built on noiseless perfect reads. The contribution of this theory was that establishing the necessary read length for complete assembly is actually determined by the repeat statistics of the DNA sequence. Naturally, the longer the read length, the less recoverage is required. In that same year, this has been put into practice by Sergey and Adam's group. I think it's really powerful to look at the graph on the left when you look at the De Bruyne graph complexity as you increase the KMER size effectively the read length. At k equals to 5,000, you are down to one node. You've basically assembled it. What they've also done was looking at the existing bacterial genomes at the time, and they predicted that, quote unquote, all but the longest class three repeats can now be resolved. Looking at this paper yesterday again, I found the, the uh, conclusion of this paper to be really a harbinger of what is to come. They wrote, we expect the reduction in pack bio sequencing costs to increase the number of completed genomes, improve the quality of microbial genome databases, and enable high fidelity population scale studies of pan genomes and chromosomal organization. I think eight years later, we've really reached that point. But Sergey and Adam's bacterial genome assembler used short reads to error correct. This was called the hybrid assembly approach back then. The first dedicated PacBio long read assembler did not come about until Jason Chin, while working at PacBio, came up with the HGAP process. The concept was to use the longest CLR reads as quote unquote seed reads to align the shorter reads for error correction. These pre assembled reads were then fed into the Solero assembler. HGAP became PacBio's first productized assembler. The next journey in the PacBio assembler was to go into larger diploid genomes. Falcon is a string graph assembler that used a new aligner developed at the time, the aligner by G. Myers, which was faster than the Blazer aligner used in the HGAP process. The haplotypes were represented as bubbles in the string graph, which were then unzipped into primary and alternative contigs using heterozygous variants in those bubbles. But as impressive as it was, Falcon unzip was ultimately still producing what's called pseudo haplotypes. That is, the primary contest can contain haplotype, haplotype switches. What you see here is on the right-hand side where you see this mix, mix match of pseudohaplotypes going from uh, the red to the blue are the two alleles. And this is because there was no long-range information that was being used. So enter trio binning. 
I actually don't remember which year at PAG it was that Sergey and Adam and Tisbeth debuted the Triobini approach. The idea was to sequence both the parental of the F1 data. Using the short read data for the parental data, they could pre-bin the PacBio CLR data by their Cayman signatures and assemble them into two haplotypes individually. I distinctly remember the common sentiment at PAG that year was, duh, why haven't we thought about this? But really, there's really just one component of the genome assembly process. What about errors? As early as 2013 and 2016, Sergey's group and David Shi had already looked both at the practical and the theoretical implications of read errors. And the idea was still that with the CLR error read length, you CR, CLR error type, you really still need some form of error correction. And now at 2019, we enter the hi-fi phase. So given that everybody's talked about hi-fi for the last few days, I will not um, talk more about it. I just wanna mention that all of the assemblers that come, really what I think is an explosion of the hi-fi golden age, beginning with Henley's hi-fi ASM. And then followed by Canoe, which started as Canoe, then Trio Canoe, and finally now High Canoe. One of the components of High Canoe was homopolymer um, compression, which Sergei, uh, sorry, Adam talked about yesterday. And then also PacBio's own version of IPA. The two major components that was included was the fast overlapper that Yvonne uh, wrote called Pancake, and also Zev actually wrote the phase separation called, did I get it right, Nighthawk? I didn't put the name in there. The third component of a good genome assembler, which I think people don't really realize was important because when you're focused on the theory of achieving good assembly, you start with the read length and the errors. But really, as we come into the age of more and more genomes and practicality, speed becomes a bottleneck. And starting in with as early as 2019, we have the unpronounceable WTDBG2 and then also Peregrine that, would, uh, that was trying to all reach the heights of a speedy assembler while not losing performance. Now we're at 2021 and things are just getting faster. And this is where we are really present day Facebook, which was only published a week ago. So I have five minutes left. I have time to talk about, meanwhile, in a galaxy far, far away, what's been happening in the transcriptome world. Well, the transcriptome world really started a lot like the genome assembly world, which is let's create falling cDNAs and cut it up and say, here you go, copy paste. This is a parallel history of what's been happening in the transcriptome space. As I made this timeline, my first impression was I am really bad at naming tools. I just call them one, two, and three. What is the difference in the computational problem for transcriptome? Well, everybody knows what transcript assembly is using short reads. The problem is a lot different because we don't need to assemble. There is no assembly. We get the following cDNA sequences. But it is not perfect. Otherwise, we all be done. The first generation of the ISOSeq algorithm that I worked on that was published in 2015 was a complex process where I was trying to find clusters of reads that I believe are coming from the same isoforms while allowing for CLR error types. I really like this um, IGV screenshot on the right because it really shows if you look at the top, the silhouette, that's the splicing graph based on the short read data and the counts are where the numbers and the arches. It is nearly impossible to computationally infer what are the number of distinct isoforms that are there, especially not when you look at the red alignments below, which are the actual path file data. Same as in the assembly verse, the need for speed is urgent. And over time, we are now arriving at ISOSeq3, which still follows actually the same concept of what isoform clustering should be like, but has now taken away some of the uh, components that are not necessary now that we have hi-fi accuracy. I wanna take uh, 30 seconds to talk about something that I thought was a crazy idea back then, still probably a crazy idea now, which is what happens if you only have the isoseq data but no genome? Can you actually recreate the genome from isoseq data alone? And the answer is yes, because these are full length reads. And we also know that isoforms share a lot of Kamer similarities. 
Further, if you think about how alternative splicing works, it is really just a linear combination of continuous exons or skipping events. It could be exon 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 5, 1, 3, 4, 5. With enough information of overlap of these exons, you can actually infer the coding region of this genome. Two minutes left. So um, I don't want to talk more about SCANTI. It's already been presented here in genome informatics in 2019. But I really think of SCANTI as a really pivotal point in the long read transcriptal process for coming up with a nomenclature to describe the difference of novel isoforms that long read brings. And really, this is a series of tools developed by the Anna Conessa lab. I, uh, Sconti, ISO and not, and tapas that are bringing us to functional differential isoform analysis. Ooh, I have one minute left. And um, I'm actually going to talk in the single cell session tomorrow. So uh, I will just say that the next frontier for long reads, I really think is also single cell isoseq. And then you've heard John's talk this morning on mass isoseq. So with that, I will conclude my talk. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A. Uh, since um, I'm probably gonna give others a little bit more time, um, we'll try to reserve a few minutes at the end and I will now go into the next talk. So Nechan, just let me know when you want me to scroll through the slides. Hey, thanks Liz for in introduction and invitation. My name is Nechan Chen. I'm currently a PhD student at Hopkins working with Ben Langmi, Adam Philippi, and Sergey Koren. Today, I'm going to introduce our software that performs fast and accurate coordinate system conversion between assemblies. Next slide, please. So first, I want to talk about the problem of migrating data sets from one reference to another. So in 2008, we got HG19. In 2013, we got HG38. But like in 2021, as we see in a survey recently published, more than 50% of the clinical labs are still using HG19, which is a, um, like, I think, 12, 13 year old reference genome. And we know that um, HG38 is higher quality. So, what's the reason? And like, um, a primary reason is the large cost of like um, human efforts and computational efforts to migrate all the data from one reference to the other. And we got nice support for all the databases based on HG19. So like um, clinical labs feel like there is a like not obvious benefit to migrate from 37 to 38. So this is um, like this, like um, what we see right now, like in the genomics field. And recently um, we talked a lot about like pack bio high five because those like very accurate long reads is kind of moving the field to a next generation, which is high quality long read based assemblies. So for example, we got the CHM13 T2T like complete reference genome, just like um, we, we got a talk from Adam yesterday and people like um, talk about like T2T reference genome a lot um, nowadays. And we have more high quality reference genomes coming. For example, we got 64 haplotype resolved reference genomes and like the HPRC reference genomes and so on. So we're moving toward um, a future or like um, the next step of genomics, which is we have more than one reference genome. And we probably want to utilize the improved coverage, improved completeness, and improved quality of the new like um, hi fi or other long read based assemblies. So it is important to benefit from new references and also being compatible with current one and want to migrate things easily. So next slide, please. So um, there are leftover approaches. For example, um, people might be familiar with like leftover methods such as UCSC leftover, which has been there for a while, or cross map. So they are um, commonly used to migrate genomic annotations, for example, bed file or gene annotations or variants from one reference to the other, like for example, human to mice or 37 to 38 conversions. But it is not always accurate, um, especially in regions where references differ, because if we got new references, new bases in one reference, it is very hard or nearly impossible to lift um, the annotations from the old one to the new one. And we reason that um, it is hard for us to do like annotation leftover, but it would be easier 
for us to do alignment lift over because alignment has the sequence context and it is like kind of richer in information and we can likely use that um, to lift over. And then alignment is the bottleneck for many computational pipelines. So if we can save um, some time in alignment, we can save cost. And this year we published Labiosum for fast liftover of alignments using a DCF file. So it was designed for um, lifting over alignments against like um, variants with like augmented um, variants, for example, the major allele reference or some other like variants with um, small variants inserted into the um, base genome, for example, GRCH38 plus major alleles. And this is fast and this is multi-threaded, but it doesn't support assembly to assembly leftover. Could you go next slide, please? So here we develop a new um, algorithm, which is called Labiosum ASM that supports leftover using a chain file. And the chain file is the um, assembly to assembly map that is commonly used in leftover methods. So it is like the figure I show in this slide, there are like continuous um, on gap segments and like in each genome. And then there's a mapping between the on gap segment from one to the other. And so we want to support leftover using a chain file and we use succinct data structures, the SDSL library for fast leftover operations. For example, we could do leftover of position in constant time. We also support leftover of cigar strings and we can do it like usually very fast. And the Labiosum software updates all primary alignment information, including position, cigar, um, counties, and mate pair information, and including the template lens as well. And it supports multi-thread computing. Um, it takes less than an hour to lift 30x human whole genome sequencing data, and it uses less than 200 megabytes of, megabytes of memory. Next slide, please. But we show that um, it is difficult to lift over for regions where chromosomes, uh, where references differ. So we also develop a selective strategy to split the, um, the alignments into different categories. Um, for example, we got the committed category, which is we lift the reads and we think the reads there are likely to be correct. So we just um, output them as the final output. And then there are some groups of reads that we think um, we are not that sure about the quality or the correctness of these reads. So we decided to realign those reads. And then like after realign, they are concordant with the original alignment results. And then we merge everything together as our final output. So we need an indicator to tell us like, okay, is this read correct? Is this alignment correct or not? So we developed this indicator that is a um, combination of like um, alignment features, including mapping quality, alignment score, template lens, and percentage of clip faces, and also genomic features, including if this region is a collapse repeat or not. Next slide, please. So we show that um, using our labials and pipeline, um, lifting from CHM13 B1.1 to GRCH38, we get faster and more accurate results than doing alignment. And um, using our pipeline, we only need to align about 25% of the reads. So that is a um, fraction of computational cost and lift over itself is very fast. And we show that we have higher overall variant calling accuracy than using GRCH38. And the most pronounced um, improvement is in SNP recall improvement, which is we reduce about more than 3,000 false negative SNP errors and more than like um, 1,500 overall errors in the genome in the bottle, B4.2.1 regions. So that is a very pronounced um, improvement, especially we know that variant callings are like in the field of 99.6, 99.7. So like a, this improvement is um, pretty substantial. And we also show that um, using the latest genome bottle challenging medically relevant genes benchmark, um, the leftover approach from CHM13 also outperformed the baseline using GRCH38. Next slide, please. So let me show you an example of a false negative reduction. The top IGB track is the leftover track and the bottom one is GRCH38. And um, we show that there are like four right alleles called using leftover and none of them were called using GRCH38. This is BWA and D variant. And the mapability in this region is very low. It is about one over 83. So, so it is very hard to map reads to this region but um, the mappability is better using CHM13. And we think that this is because of a like um, 
the assembly quality gets higher. So a lot of like a lot of the 83 copies were like false duplications in GRC38, but then resolved by CHM13, the TDT assembly. So we got higher quality um, variant calling results. Next slide, please. So here's a brief summary. We did develop Leviosam ASM to efficiently lift over alignments using a chain file. And we also develop a selective pipeline that generates variant calls with similar or higher accuracy than running the alignment from scratch. And we can use LiveOSM to migrate data sets with good efficiency and very high accuracy. So this could be used from 37 to 38, 38 to T to T, or like vice versa. We can align things to T to T and then lift them back to 37 or 38. And we have like those unique to T to T um, reads, and then we can do analysis for those like unliftable unique reads to one specific reference genome. And we think that this can be used in the multi-reference future for genomics comparative analysis. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I'd like to thank my advisors, Ben Langmi, Adam, and Sergey for their help and all my collaborators. And this software is available on GitHub and please reach out to me if you have any questions. My I have a poster or you can find me on um, Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Nai-Chung. Um, we have, you're just on time. So um, do we have any questions? So maybe I have one when I was looking at it. So the chain file, this is assumed that you already have a chain file made, is that correct? Yes. So how, how, would you, um, how would you produce that chain file? So typically there is a UCSC recipe for to, building, to build chain files. And currently, um, recently there is a Nextflow based pipeline to build chain files with like um, better scalability. And that, that can be based on Minimap too. So it is very fast. Okay, cool. I'm just wondering, so um, this is, you've only tested this on human genomes. Do you think you're gonna test it on non-human genomes? Um, we're currently doing it on human genomes, but if there are like um, interesting applications and we're happy to test on like non-human genomes. Cool. All right, thank you. We will move on to Zev. All right, take it away. I think you have a bit more time, Zev. All right, hopefully I won't need it. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming to this presentation, everyone. So today I'm going to talk to you about reconstructing near-perfect diplotypes for complex human loci using HiFi data and our tool PBAA. Next slide, please. Uh, so why, why, are why, why would, are people interested in Amplicon data or targeted data, PacBio targeted data rather than whole genome sequencing? And this is just one example. Imagine that you're studying a gene that carries a pathogenic allele and you're interested in studying the natural variation within that exon or several exons or genomic region. Amplicon analysis uh, enables you to target these regions, sequence these regions, and then uh, produce near perfect diplotypes uh, from PacBio HiFi Amplicon data. So, uh, PacBio Amplicons range, you can get Amplicons pretty easily in the, in the range of 300 to 20 KB. And so, for example, uh, in this toy example, you're studying exon tune in gene X. And so, you're gonna, going to design primers and barcodes for your region of interest. And that allows you to sequence many individuals on a single smart cell. Um, and then you can deconvolve those with the barcodes and amplicon analysis to a, a diplotype. And so what is a diplotype? A diplotype is your maternal and paternal haplotype over a gene of interest. I can't draw. And so that would allow you to stratify your population by alleles. Next slide. So we've looked at uh, using Amplicon analysis on a number of human disease alleles, drug metabolism alleles, viral Amplicons, including SARS-CoV-2, HIV, and adenovirus, and also uh, plant genes that are involved in insect, uh, plant and insect alleles for herbicide resistance or insecticide resistance. And so for some of the human disease alleles um, that we've seen Amplicon analysis work really well are Fragile X, which is a really tough repeat structure, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, and GBA, which is Gaucher's disease. Um, next slide, please. 
So our software, it, our HiFi specific Amplicon analysis is called PBAA or PacBio uh, Amplicon analysis. It's designed to cluster complex mixtures of Amplicon targets from PacBio HiFi reads. Next slide, please. So this is the workflow. It begins with a HiFi FASTQ file and guide sequences. And the guide sequences provide a rough framework where we can place reads into the, um, into the as I call them, bucketing, genomic bucketing. And, and uh, so you place the reads to different regions. And then within those regions, you do all by all read alignment. And then you do error masking, cluster k-means clustering, consensus generation, and filtering of the final consensus sequences. And so in the end, you end up with three files, consensus pass, which represent the high quality alleles, consensus fail, which represents low quality or low coverage alleles, and this read info, which tells you the uh, cluster assignment for each read. So I'll go into a little bit more detail of some of the steps. Next slide, please. So read placement um, is really binning reads to the gene or allele which they belong to. And it's the Goldilocks principle, um, meaning that if you have too many guide sequences or too few, you can have issues. So imagine that you have uh, two genes that are very similar. They, they're, maybe they only differ by a couple hundred base pairs across the whole gene. So in this example below, we have two sequences, guide sequences, and the circles represent kamers which are specific to either one of the two sequences. And we call these guide specific kamers. And so from these two sequences, after filtering, we end up with two distinct sets, one for haplotype one, kamers for haplotype one, and kamers for haplotype two. Then we read over all of the hi-fi reads and assign them to their guide specific, uh, to their guide based on the counts of guide specific kamers. Next slide. So then we do, um, all by all read alignment. And then we sort the read alignment by decreasing percent identity. And so for every read in the data set, we have some subset of reads that, al that align back to it. And so this alignment is sorted um, by decreasing alignment. We keep the top 50 or 100 reads. And what that's doing is that's enriching for reads that are of the same haplotype. And then we do air masking. And so what we do is we look across the HiFi read, A read here, and we uh, measure the number of bases at every given position that have support in the other reads. Um, we also do some um, error masking using FRED scale QV values from the HiFi reads. Um, for example, some of the genes, the alleles that we're interested in differ only by homopolymer differences. And so rather than, than uh, doing things like what we do in assembly where we homopolymer compress and ignore differences, we actually uh, measure the, the Fred scale quality of those differences. And so we end up with near perfect HiFi reads after this error correction step. Next slide. So this is an example of um, the, the alignment or the percent identity of each reads alignment. And so I'm showing you here on the left is the HiFi, error corrected HiFi reads mapped back to a, a reference. And you can see that they're colored, there's some coloring and that denotes the clusters, which corresponds to this network here on the right. Each one of the dots on the network on the right is a HiFi read and the links show uh, perfect sequence overlap or alignment to, to the other reads. And so you can see that the clusters really do resolve nicely after this error correction except for a few outlier reads that are in the middle of those, the light blue and the green cluster that are shown in the network. Next slide. So we provide a downstream tool called PBAA BAM Paint, which allows you to color the reads in an IGV uh, session based on the cluster assignment in PBAA. So what I'm showing you here are the alignments of the PBAA clusters or consensus sequence here on the top panel. And you can see the two different alleles uh, shown in dark blue. And then below are the reads that correspond, the underlying reads that correspond to these clusters. In this case, we're actually looking at a human uh, gene that contains an STR allele and the blue box highlights a 300 base pair deletion uh, in, a, in a short tandem repeat. And so you can see how nicely that resolves. 
and also how nicely the SNP pattern maps to the two um, PBAA clusters. Next slide. So how do we know that PBAA is working? Uh, well, we had we benchmarked it on HLA, and we've also um, used it on a number of cytochrome P450 alleles. Next slide. So we know that PBA achieves really high accuracy because we're using the HLA Gen VX truth uh, set, which contains greater than a thousand alleles. Um, and we did a, a coverage titration. And so we recommend that you have at least 20 X hi-fi coverage of each allele. And so by 40 X, your accuracy is like around 98, 99%. And we're measuring the accuracy here is the number of alleles that match up to the, the, proper, um, the proper ground truth allele. Now, we also measure error, and we're measuring error as the number of base, the average number of base pairs that differs between a 3000 KB uh, amplicon target and the ground truth. And so at 20 fold coverage, there are 0.2 base pair errors. That's less than one. Uh, base pair error. And by 40x coverage, you have less than a tenth of an error uh, over the over an amplicon. And no amplicons had more than five base pairs of error sequence uh, error compared to the reference. And actually the, the highest rate of error uh, is in the class two HLA, which has a notoriously diff difficult uh, short, short uh, dinucleotide repeat that it's even difficult to know, looking at short read data, what, what the right count is in that region. Uh, next slide. So I'm just going to walk you through some of the interesting um, diplotypes that we see in the CYP genes. The CYP genes are cytochrome P450s are really important to drug metabolism. Um, and so there's a great deal of interest in studying the diversity of alleles. Um, and similar to HLA, they're both structurally and um, they're structurally diverse. There's all sorts of things going on from gene fusions to duplications. And so um, this IGB screenshot, the top shows you the SNP panel uh, that allows us to classify or diplotype the PBAA alleles. And so each alignment here shows a consensus allele coming out of PBAA. Next slide, please. So in the first example, um, we have two alleles in this individual, but that's what a diplotype is. They're, they're noted by the star nomenclature. And so we have star 35 and star 41 shown down here in the bottom. Um, and you can see that the first one has just a few SNPs that differ from the second one. And so that's one of the cool parts about PBAA is it can resolve like differences of a single SNP even in a homopolymer. Next slide. So this is a, a fun, um, computationally fun one. So instead of being, you know, instead of having just two, it's a double duplication. And so you can see that the star two allele has been du duplicated. And so you can see the uh, star two dupe. This clipping pattern is part of the junction of the duplication. So that's why it's clipped when mapped back to the reference. So you can see how nicely um, the star two do, uh, maps to the uh, star two. And similarly, star four uh, has a duplication as, as well. Next slide. So I'm showing you two different individuals here. One individual has a star two lesion, a star two allele, and a star five. And the star five is actually a deletion. So you can see this gap alignment here on the bottom represents the deletion allele. And the final uh, phenotype, or sorry, uh, final diplotype I'm showing you is star 10, star 2, and star 36. And star 36 is actually a fusion uh, allele. So this person is carrying three copies, and one of them is a, is a fusion. Next slide. So PBA is accurate for diplotyping in humans. Uh, it util utilizes hi fi read accuracy to generate near perfect clusters. And importantly, PBA resolves everything from a single SNP to large structural variants. Like I said, including like single SNPs and homopolymers or dinucleotide repeats. I didn't have time to talk about a lot of the off-color applications that we use PBAA for. So PBAA works on pooled data, for example, and we're working on improving it to work on tiled amplicon data. Next slide. 
So I'd just like to acknowledge um, some of the people who have helped us along the way. So the Weigel Lab um, has given us some great test data that we've used. And within PacBio, I'd like to um, note John Harding, Yvonne Sovic, James Drake, Derek Barnett, and David Seifert. Next slide, please. Um, I want to do a shout out that PacBio is hiring. We have lots of bioinformatic positions open. Um, we're growing rapidly, and there's um, PacBio has just been a really fun place to work over the last three years I've worked at PacBio. And so I would encourage you, if you're you know, a finishing student or looking for a new job, please consider uh, applying to PacBio. Next slide. Great. Uh, with that, I am happy to take any questions. There's one question, and in fact, I think that is <laughs> exactly what I would have asked too. Was PPAA tested in metagenomics or quasi-species viral data? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, it, it works on HIV. Um, a lot of the, the data that we receive um, can't be shared. So if you have public data sets that you're interested in trying, we're always um, apt for challenging uh, genomes. Um, PBA is computationally limited by the N square alignment stage. Uh, we're working on ways to speed that up, but that's the biggest limitation to quasi species. Um, it's a general clustering tool. So yeah, it works on a lot of different applications. Cool. Any more questions? Also, um, and Nei Chang, I know that you, if you, you were very intent, if you had any questions for Zev, um, feel free to ask. Yeah, I'm curious, like, um, because I saw variant colors such as oct octopus, they kind of um, split by haplotype and then perform variant calling. Is this similar to PBAA? Yeah, so um, the frequencies of the haplotypes can really affect uh, calling. So, sorry, I'm not familiar with the caller you, you mentioned. What was it? It is the octopus variant caller. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with it at all. Um, so what we do know is tools like deep variant and standard variant calling pipelines are tuned for diploids, right? And so that the model has to be extended for um, different, um, different frequencies or different mixes. So may, I don't know, octopus might be it. Uh, remember the only, the, uh, the thing is, is that PBA is not a variant caller. It generates the consensus sequences. It's, so um, it's slightly different outcome than a caller. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, perhaps, um, Zef, do you want to mention that we have used it on, um, you know, the one of the releases in SmartLink was doing the uh, Amplicon version of SARS-CoV-2 calling using PBAA. And actually um, that, you know, the variant calling part was actually a byproduct, right, of, of running PBAA. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, so we've used it on SARS-CoV-2 plant genomes. Um, if you have human amplicon data a targeted of interesting regions or challenging that you think we're always really excited to take a look at that because um, yeah, it's just really fun and exciting. So like for example, the GBA, um, I don't have data I can show, but um, that's a really challenging gene because GBA1 and GBA2 are, are paralogs and they're, they're very, very, very close to being nearly identical. So the PBA can resolve those parallels. Cool. Thank you, everyone. All right, last talk. Hi, so my name is Richard Hall. I'm director of biomass applications at PacBio. And my presentation today is gonna to go into some new work looking at methylation detection um, using hi-fi sequencing. Oh, next slide. Um, so we know that DNA methylation has an effect on human disease, whether that be inherited diseases or other types of disease state. And we know from previous work, this is mostly 5MC in CPG context. Um, this is something that we've always had an interest in at PacBio, and over the years we've kind of looked at and spent some time with, but we've never had a real solution in this space. So next slide. And up until now, if people wanted to do large studies like this, um, it was mostly done with bisulfite sequencing and short read sequencing. And there is some 
really there have been some really big programs in the space, particularly in ENCO and the epigenetics project. Um, next slide. So one of the things that has been true about PAC biosequencing since the release of our first sequencer is that we have been able to detect methylation and any kind of base modification by looking at the kinetics of how the enzyme incorporates bases. Um, because the way that we do our sequencing in real time, we're measuring the incorporation events as pulses of specific bases. And we measure the distance between the pulses as well as the size of the pulses themselves. So that's the pulse width and the interpulse inter duration. And we know that any change in the underlying template, whether that's DNA damage or a methylation event or another kind of addition to the um, canonical base affects this methylate, affects this kinetics, and we can detect it in our raw data. Next slide. One of the kind of primary modification types in bacteria, and one of the most apparent when you look at kinetics in packed bio data is the 6 methyl A, and that causes a really big pausing event. And it's been shown in bacteria in which this is one of the major modifications that it's very readily um, detectable with PAC bio data. And that's led to a lot of the kind of studies in restriction modification systems in bacteria. Next slide. But just because a base is methylated doesn't mean that it has the same kinetic effect. Um, 6MA for one reason or another has a very pronounced effect on the IPD ratio. And we can see that in this plot on the left. Um, but 5-methyl-C, which is the modification that we're really interested in and looking at and characterizing human disease, doesn't have anywhere near the magnitude of effect on the IPD ratio, and it seems to have a spread out signal. So going back to kind of early PacBio based modification pipelines, we've always had a really strong signal for 6MA, but the 5-MC has always been problematic, and we haven't had a really good solution for detecting this in kind of higher eukaryotic systems. Next slide. Um, so this is just a demonstration of the 6MA signal is actually strong enough that we don't even need to have any particular clever training or models. We can just look at the IPD ratio and it is so pronounced in the 6-methyl-A that we can just look at the IPD, ra IPD ratio for any A and decide whether it's been methylated or not. But that's not the case for the 5MC. Next slide. So in trying to address this historically, we're dealing with kind of a low signal to noise problem. And one of the approaches for getting over to low, low signal to noise is averaging over some direction of the data. And one of the first implementations with PacBio to look at CPG sites was to actually just average over template position and try and understand where there are high concentrations of CPGs that have been modified in CPG islands. And that's this um, paper from Shinichi Morishita's group that was a number of years ago now that showed that you can get reasonably good estimations of kind of where in a human genome is methylated at CPGs by increasing your signal by averaging over the template position. Next slide. Now, one of the things that changed kind of fundamentally with PacBio data recently is that we sequence circular molecules, so we sequence the same strand, the template over and over again, and we can call a consensus, giving us a hi-fi read. So we know that that results in very accurate reads for our sequencing, but we've also been thinking about that and how that affects kinetics, because now we're in a position where not only can we generate multiple observations of the sequence in order to calculate an accurate read? We're generating multiple observations of the kinetics, which can also be used to increase the signal to noise of the kinetics. And we started to think about whether that could really lead to a more accurate methylation and a more accurate prediction of methylation. Next. So in, in thinking about this, um, a group that kind of we were made aware of when the paper was published had actually been thinking along the same lines and looking at kind of using the multiple passes of the same molecule and trying to detect single molecule resolution CPG methylation, 5-methyl-C. Um, and that's this paper from um, Dennis Lowe's group. And they showed that they could have really good 
or usable precision in whole genome experiments looking at CPG methylation. Next slide. And in parallel to this work, we also have, we're also looking at kind of detection using um, multiple paths to the same molecule in the same way. And we came up with a, a proof of concept using a CNN um, machine learning approach um, and this feature vector, which is a window of 16 base pairs over the modified base. Um, and this we know from kind of enzyme structure and kinetics is reasonably close to what the expected footprint of the DNA would be over the enzyme. Um, but all, even though that we've come to this size of a vector by experimentation, rather than just using what we know of enzyme kinetics. Next slide. So to train a neural network model, we need good training data. And fortunately, it's relatively easy to generate libraries of human DNA that's either fully modified or fully methylated at CPG sites or fully unmethylated. For fully unmethylated, it just has to be go through an amplification process. Um, unfortunately, we have uh, ultra low input DNA prep, which includes amplification. So we can just take a DNA, a human DNA sample, amplify it and run that. And that gives us completely unmodified and our negative control. Um, and there's also a CPG methyl transferase that is very effective at getting 100% or close to 100% of the CPGs in a genome methylated. And we use that to generate a true positive. And that gives us our training data um, for our machine learning model. Next slide. So what does that look like? Um, given that we have a very clean negative positive data set and we're not using real human or native DNA, we can quite accurately measure precision and recall for single molecule estimation of whether a CPG is 5 methylc modified. And right now with the current model that we have, a proof of concept, we're at a precision of about 86% with about 85% recall. Um, so we think going forward, and this is from a standard library. So there's no special library preparation. We're not sequencing shorter inserts. This is the same library that would be used to call SVs, to call short variants, um, and kind of any human WGS library preparation. Next slide. Um, and one of the things that we know if, because we know the relationship between a, a single pass and what that does to the signal, one of the first questions that we asked was, if we were to have a lot more passes and increase our signal to noise ratio, does that increase our accuracy um, of being able to call these methylated CPGs? as you would expect, and it does. And we know that if we have a really high number of passes, which maybe isn't realistic for a normal library preparation, um, but we can get really high accuracy on a single molecule level of being able to call the CPGs of whether they're 5-methyl-C modified or not. Um, right now, a standard library is kind of shifted towards the three to five pass range, um, which kind of is in line with what we see for the accuracy on a whole data set. Next slide. So one of the nice things about being able to work with genome and bottle samples like HG002, 1, and 5 is that there's a lot of other work out there. And fortunately, there's been a, a project from um, CXC2 or the EpiQC, which was a publication recently uh, from Chris Mason's group by Jonathan Fuchs, that looks at the reproducibility and how well other methods work for calling um, 5-methyl-C methylation. Unfortunately, we could get this data and we could test it against our method to see what the correlation was in reference space. So now we take, we've take we taken the calls that we have for a single molecule, we've aligned to a reference, and we're calling at any reference CPG how methylated it is. And we can compare that with these other techniques that were sequenced for the paper. Um, EMSeq, which is an enzymatic bisulfite type sequencing. So it causes a base substitution, but it's not bisulfite. EPIC 850K is an Illumina array technology looking at 850,000 sites. And methylseq is a bisulfite sequencing. And what we can see here is just a correlation of our reference space calls for the three different samples compared to these other technologies. And you can see the HG002, which actually in this example has a higher coverage than the HG105. It's about 45x, the one and five are about 30x. 
Um, we're about 0 0.93, 0 0.94 um, correlation with these other technologies. They do have a higher correlation between themselves, but we think we're getting close to being able to have um, reproducibility and be able to recapitulate the results from these other technologies at a high resolution. Um, while also off being able to offer this as an additional data type to a regular sequence experiment without any additional costs, given there's no difference in the library preparation. Next slide. Um, so just pulling out a few areas of interest. Um, so this gene is one that's known to be paternally imprinted. And you can see that we have the, a bunch of different kind of graphs up top that just show the reproducibility of the calls in reference space. And then the IGV alignment here, the darker the color of the base, the more methylated it is. And we can see that if we kind of phase um, the paternal and maternal haplotypes, one of them is unmethylated and one of them is methylated. And the point here is that there is actually a line element in this region. And if you were to do bisulfite, you wouldn't actually be able to phase across this line element. So we're actually getting phasing of these two CPG islands. Next slide. And this is another example from a collaborator that we're working with, um, Matthew Bainbridge at Rady. Um, this was presented at ASHG this year. And this is, it's a sample that we know we should have been able to see something. Um, so it, it, it isn't a case where we've managed to make a diagnosis, but we're looking at a, a patient, a, an individual that has a uniparental heterodisomy of chromosome 15, which results in this Prader-Willi syndrome. And you can see here, if we phase the methylation calls um, and in the control, you have one haplotype that's fully methylated and one that's unmethylated, but in the um, affected individual, both of the chromosomes are fully methylated in this region. Um, and this is a region that has genes that are known to um, result in a Prader-Willi-like syndrome. Next slide. So right now we do have um, proof of concept code that we're sharing with early collaborators. Um, the output of that is just a BAM tag that is, has a, a number that estimates whether we think a CG is methylated or not. Um, and that is just really the implementation that we put in place in order to make it a usable data set and kind of something that people can work with. Next slide. Next. Yeah. Um, but moving forward, we are looking at implementing the standard um, tag that has been implemented in SAM for recording these methylation signals. And that is now supported in IGV. So we're hoping that we'll have something where you can actually visualize this data in IGV. Next slide. And, and just a summary. So we, we have models for calculating um, CPG methylation in hi-fi reads. Um, we've been able to show that you can, show, that you, that you can see imprinting in um, cases where we know that there's issues in um, particular samples. And we're actually moving towards kind of having a standard representation so that it will fit in with kind of downstream tools. And I just say this is still kind of very much under development at Backfire. And that's it. Cool. Thank you, Richard. Any questions from the QA chat? Please use that. Okay. Any recommendation? So, this is the question uh, from Francisco. Any recommendation for filtering methylation results? IPD values, QV coverage, P value. Um, so for this for this approach, we're not we're losing the IPD value and not using that in the downstream analysis. Um, we give a, a score of whether we think something is methylated or not, and you can see from those ROC curves that it at the number of passes for a regular library, you can obviously um, get a higher precision by increasing that cutoff, um, but you will lose a lot of the recall. Um, it's it's pretty well, it, it the, the ROC curve performs reasonably normally over the range of um, scores. So it depends exactly what the goal of the experiment is. Cool. 
Well, maybe I'll ask a relatively simplistic one since um, I'm not, you know, this is something that's new to me is that for the training, you only need to like train it on one of the genomes like HG002 and it applies to all other human genomes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because we're training on an unmethylated versus fully methylated, um, even if you only have kind of 30x coverage of each data set, you have so many examples of kind of all the sequence contexts that you don't even need all of the data mm -hmm. within 30x to train at a reasonable level. Like there, there simply aren't sequence context, like 16 base pair sequence contexts that would be novel to any individual that would right. really warrant sure. like including further individuals. I mean, there might be some, but it's one in a hundreds of thousands. Cool. So that you only have to train once and then that model could be used. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right.